Chapter One, Part G of the Wealth of Nations, Book Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, Book Five, Chapter One, Part G, of the Expenses of the Sovereign or Commonwealth. Article Three of the expense of the institutions for the instruction of people of all ages the institutions for the instruction of people of all ages are chiefly those for religious instruction this is a species of instruction of which the object is not so much to render the people good citizens in this world as to prepare them for another and a better world in the life to come the teachers of the doctrine which contains this instruction, in the same manner as other teachers, may either depend altogether for their subsistence upon the voluntary contributions of their hearers, or they may derive it from some other fund to which the law of their country may entitle them, such as landed estate, a tithe, or land tax, an established salary or stipend. Their exertion, their zeal and industry, are likely to be much greater in the former situation than in the latter. In this respect, the teachers of a new religion have always had a considerable advantage in attacking those ancient and established systems, of which the clergy, reposing themselves upon their benefices, had neglected to keep up the fervor of faith and devotion in the great body of the people, and having given themselves up to indolence, were become altogether incapable of making any vigorous exertion in defense even of their own establishment. The clergy of an established and well-endowed religion frequently become men of learning and elegance who possess all the virtues of gentlemen, or which can recommend them to the esteem of gentlemen. But they are apt gradually to lose the qualities, both good and bad, which gave them authority and influence with the inferior ranks of people, and which had perhaps been the original causes of the success and establishment of their religion. Such a clergy, when attacked by a set of popular and bold, though perhaps stupid and ignorant enthusiasts, feel themselves as perfectly defenseless as the indolent, effeminate and full-fed nations of the southern parts of asia when they were invaded by the active hardy and hungry tartars of the north such a clergy upon such an emergency have commonly no other resource than to call upon the civil magistrate to persecute destroy or drive out their adversaries as disturbers of the public peace it was thus that the roman catholic clergy called upon the civil magistrate to persecute the protestants and the church of england to persecute the dissenters and that in general every religious sect when it has once enjoyed for a century or two the security of a legal establishment has found itself incapable of making any vigorous defence against any new sect which chose to attack its doctrine or discipline upon such occasions the advantage in point of learning and good writing may sometimes be on the side of the established church but the arts of popularity all the arts of gaining proselytes are constantly on the side of its adversaries in England, those arts have been long neglected by the well-endowed clergy of the established church, and are at present chiefly cultivated by the dissenters and by the Methodists. The independent provisions, however, which in many places have been made for dissenting teachers by means of voluntary subscriptions, of trust rights, and other evasions of the law, seem very much to have abated the zeal and activity of those teachers. They have many of them become very learned, ingenious, and respectable men but they have in general ceased to be very popular preachers the methodists without half the learning of the dissenters are much more in vogue in the church of rome the industry and zeal of the inferior clergy are kept more alive by the powerful motive of self-interest than perhaps in any established protestant church the parochial clergy derive many of them a very considerable part of their subsistence from the voluntary oblations of the people a source of revenue which confession gives them many opportunities of improving. The mendicant orders derive their whole subsistence from such oblations. It is with them as with the hussars and light infantry of some armies. No plunder, no pay. The parochial clergy are like those teachers whose reward depends partly upon their salary and partly upon the fees or honoraries which they get from their pupils, and these must always depend, more or less, upon their industry and reputation. The mendicant orders are like those teachers whose subsistence depends altogether upon their industry. They are obliged, therefore, to use every art which can animate the devotion of the common people. 
the establishment of the two great mendicant orders of St. Dominic and St. Francis, it is observed by Machiavel, revived, in the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries, the languishing faith and devotion of the Catholic Church. In Roman Catholic countries, the spirit of devotion is supported altogether by the monks, and by the poor parochial clergy. The great dignitaries of the church, with all the accomplishments of gentlemen and men of the world, and sometimes with those of men of learning, are careful to maintain the necessary discipline over their inferiors, but seldom give themselves any trouble about the instruction of the people. Most of the arts and professions in a state, says by far the most illustrious philosopher and historian of the present age, are of such a nature that while they promote the interests of the society they are also useful or agreeable to some individuals and in that case the constant rule of the magistrate except perhaps on the first introduction of any art is to leave the profession to itself and trust its encouragement to the individuals who reap the benefit of it the artisans finding their profits to rise by the favor of their customers increase as much as possible their skill and industry and as matters are not disturbed by any injudicious tampering the commodity is always sure to be at all times nearly proportioned to the demand but there are also some callings which though useful and even necessary in a state bring no advantage or pleasure to any individual and the supreme power is obliged to alter its conduct with regard to the retainers of those professions it must give them public encouragement in order to their subsistence and it must provide against that negligence to which they will naturally be subject either by annexing particular honors to profession by establishing a long subordination of ranks and a strict dependence or by some other expedient the persons employed in the finances fleets and magistracy are instances of this order of men it may naturally be thought at first sight that the ecclesiastics belong to the first class and that their encouragement as well as that of lawyers and physicians may safely be entrusted to the liberality of individuals who are attached to their doctrines and who find benefit or consolation from their spiritual ministry and assistance their industry and vigilance will no doubt be whetted by such an additional motive and their skill in the profession as well as their address in governing the minds of the people must receive daily increase from their increasing practice study and attention but if we consider the matter more closely we shall find that this interested diligence of the clergy is what every wise legislature will study to prevent because in every religion except the true it is highly pernicious and it has even a natural tendency to pervert the truth by infusing into it a strong mixture of superstition folly and delusion each ghostly practitioner in order to render himself more precious and sacred in the eyes of his retainers will inspire them with the most violent abhorrence of all other sects and continually endeavor by some novelty to excite the languid devotion of his audience no regard will be paid to truth morals or decency in the doctrines inculcated every tenet will be adopted that best suits the disorderly affections of the human frame customers will be drawn to each conventicle by new industry and address in practising on the passions and credulity of the populace and in the end the civil magistrate will find that he has dearly paid for his intended frugality in saving a fixed establishment for the priests and that in reality the most decent and advantageous composition which he can make with the spiritual guides is to bribe their indolence by assigning stated salaries to their professions and rendering it superfluous for them to be farther active than merely to prevent their flock from straying in quest of new pastors and in this manner ecclesiastical establishments though commonly they arose at first from religious views prove in the end advantageous to the political interests of society but whatever may have been the good or bad effects of the independent provision of the clergy it has perhaps been very seldom bestowed upon them from any view to those effects times of violent religious controversy have generally been times of equally violent political faction upon such occasions each political party has either found it or imagined it for his interest to league itself with some one or other of the contending religious sects but this could be done only by adopting or at least by favoring the tenets of that particular sect the sect which had the good fortune to be leagued with the conquering party necessarily shared in the victory of its ally by whose favor and protection it was soon enabled in some degree to silence and subdue all its adversaries 
those adversaries had generally leagued themselves with the enemies of the conquering party, and were therefore the enemies of that party. The clergy of this particular sect, having thus become complete masters of the field, and their influence and authority with the great body of the people being in its highest vigor, they were powerful enough to overawe the chiefs and leaders of their own party, and to oblige the civil magistrate to respect their opinions and inclinations. Their first demand was generally that he should silence and subdue all their adversaries, and their second that he should bestow an independent provision on themselves. As they had generally contributed a good deal to the victory, it seemed not unreasonable that they should have some share in the spoil. They were weary besides of humoring the people, and of depending upon their caprice for a subsistence. In making this demand, therefore, they consulted their own ease and comfort, without troubling themselves about the effect which it might have, in future times, upon the influence and authority of their order. The civil magistrate, who could comply with their demand only by giving them something which he would have chosen much rather to take, or to keep to himself, was seldom very forward to grant it. Necessity, however, always forced him to submit at last, though frequently not till after many delays, evasions, and affected excuses. But if politics had never called in the aid of religion, had the conquering party never adopted the tenets of one sect more than those of another, when it had gained the victory, it would probably have dealt equally and impartially with all the different sects, and have allowed every man to choose his own priest and his own religion, as he thought proper. There would, and in this case no doubt have been, a great multitude of religious sects. Almost every different congregation might probably have had a little sect by itself, or have entertained some peculiar tenets of its own. Each teacher would, no doubt, have felt himself under the necessity of making the utmost exertion, and of using every art, both to preserve and to increase the number of his disciples. But as every other teacher would have felt himself under the same necessity, the success of no one teacher, or sect of teachers, could have been very great. The interested and active zeal of religious teachers can be dangerous and troublesome only when there is either but one sect tolerated in the society, or where the whole of a large society is divided into two or three great sects, the teachers of each acting by concert and under a regular discipline and subordination. But that zeal must be altogether innocent, where the society is divided into two or three hundred, or perhaps into as many thousand small sects, of which no one could be considerable enough to disturb the public tranquillity. The teachers of each sect, seeing themselves surrounded on all sides with more adversaries than friends, would be obliged to learn that candor and moderation which are so seldom to be found among the teachers of those great sects, whose tenets, being supported by the civil magistrate, are held in veneration by almost all the inhabitants of extensive kingdoms and empires, and who, therefore, see nothing round them but followers, disciples, and humble admirers. The teachers of each little sect, finding themselves almost alone, would be obliged to respect those of almost every other sect, and the concessions which they would mutually find in both convenient and agreeable to make one to another might in time probably reduce the doctrine of the greater part of them to that pure and rational religion free from every mixture of absurdity imposture or fanaticism such as wise men have in all ages of the world wished to see established but such as positive law has perhaps never yet established and probably never will establish in any country because with regard to religion positive law always has been and probably always will be more or less influenced by popular superstition and enthusiasm this plan of ecclesiastical government or more properly of no ecclesiastical government was what the sect called independence a sect no doubt of very wild enthusiasts proposed to establish in england towards the end of the civil war if it had been established, though of a very unphilosophical origin, it would probably, by this time, have been productive of the most philosophical good temper and moderation with regard to every sort of religious principle. It has been established in Pennsylvania, where, though the Quakers happen to be the most numerous, the law, in reality, favors no one sect more than another, and it is there said to have been productive of this philosophical good temper and moderation. But though this equality of treatment should not be productive of this good temper and moderation in all, or even in the greater part of the religious sects of a particular country, 
Yet, provided those sects were sufficiently numerous, and each of them consequently too small to disturb the public tranquillity, the excessive zeal of each for its particular tenets could not well be productive of any very hurtful effects, but, on the contrary, of several good ones. And if the government was perfectly decided, both to let them all alone, and to oblige them all to let alone one another, there is little danger that they would not, of their own accord, subdivide themselves fast enough, so as soon to become sufficiently numerous. In every civilized society, in every society where the distinction of ranks has once been completely established, there have been always two different schemes or systems of morality current at the same time, of which the one may be called the strict or austere, the other the liberal, or, if you will, the loose system. The former is generally admired and revered by the common people, the latter is commonly more esteemed and adopted by what are called the people of fashion. The degree of disapprobation with which we ought to mark the vices of levity, the vices which are apt to arise from great prosperity, and from the excess of gaiety and good humor, seems to constitute the principal distinction between those two opposite schemes or systems. In the liberal or loose system, luxury, wanton, and even disorderly mirth, the pursuit of pleasure to some degree of intemperance, the breach of chastity, at least in one of the two sexes, etc., provided they are not accompanied with gross indecency, and do not lead to falsehood and injustice, are generally treated with a good deal of indulgence, and are easily either excused or pardoned altogether. In the austere system, on the contrary, those excesses are regarded with the utmost abhorrence and detestation. The vices of levity are always ruinous to the common people, and a single week's thoughtlessness and dissipation is often sufficient to undo a poor workman for ever, and to drive him, through despair, upon committing the most enormous crimes. The wiser and better sort of the common people, therefore, have always the utmost abhorrence and detestation of such excesses, which their experience tells them are so immediately fatal to people of their condition. The disorder and extravagance of several years, on the contrary, will not always ruin a man of fashion, and people of that rank are very apt to consider the power of indulging in some degree of excess as one of the advantages of their fortune, and the liberty of doing so without censure or reproach as one of the privileges which belong to their station. In people of their own station, therefore, they regard such excesses with but a small degree of disapprobation, and censure them either very slightly or not at all. Almost all religious sects have begun among the common people, from whom they have generally drawn their earliest, as well as their most numerous proselytes. The austere system of morality has, accordingly, been adopted by those sects almost constantly, or with very few exceptions, for there have been some. It was the system by which they could best recommend themselves to that order of people, to whom they first proposed their plan of reformation upon what had been before established. Many of them, perhaps the greater part of them, have even endeavored to gain credit by refining upon this austere system, and by carrying it to some degree of folly and extravagance, and this excessive rigor has frequently recommended them, more than anything else, to the respect and veneration of the common people. A man of rank and fortune is, by his station, the distinguished member of a great society, who attend to every part of his conduct, and who thereby oblige him to attend to every part of it himself. His authority and consideration depend very much upon the respect which this society bears to him. He dares not do anything which would disgrace or discredit him in it, and he is obliged to a very strict observation of that species of morals, whether liberal or austere, which the general consent of this society prescribes to persons of his rank and fortune. A man of low condition, on the contrary, is far from being a distinguished member of any great society. While he remains in a country village, his conduct may be attended to, and he may be obliged to attend to it himself. In this situation, and in this situation only, he may have what is called a character to lose. But as soon as he comes into a great city, he is sunk in obscurity and darkness. His conduct is observed and attended to by nobody, and he is therefore very likely to neglect it himself, and to abandon himself to every sort of low profligacy and vice. He never emerges so effectually from this obscurity, his conduct never excites so much the attention of any respectable society, as by his becoming the member of a small religious sect. 
he from that moment acquires a degree of consideration which he never had before. All his brother sectaries are, for the credit of the sect, interested to observe his conduct, and if he gives occasion to any scandal, if he deviates very much from those austere morals which they almost always require of one another, to punish him by what is always a very severe punishment, even where no evil effects attend it, expulsion or excommunication from the sect. In little religious sects, accordingly, the morals of the common people have been almost always remarkably regular and orderly, generally much more so than in the established church. The morals of those little sects, indeed, have frequently been rather disagreeably rigorous and unsocial. There are two very easy and effectual remedies, however, by whose joint operation the state might, without violence, correct whatever was unsocial or disagreeably rigorous in the morals of all the little sects into which the country was divided. The first of those remedies is the study of science and philosophy, which the state might render almost universal among all people of middling or more than middling rank and fortune not by giving salaries to teachers in order to make them negligent and idle, but by instituting some sort of probation, even in the higher and more difficult sciences, to be undergone by every person before he was permitted to exercise any liberal profession, or before he could be received as a candidate for any honorable office, of trust or profit. If the state imposed upon this order of men the necessity of learning, it would have no occasion to give itself any trouble without providing them with proper teachers. They would soon find better teachers for themselves than any whom the state could provide for them. Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition, and where all the superior ranks of people were secured from it, the inferior ranks could not be much exposed to it. The second of those remedies is the frequency and gaiety of public diversions. The state, by encouraging, that is, by giving entire liberty to all those who, from their own interest, would attempt, without scandal or indecency, to amuse and divert the people by painting, poetry, music, dancing, by all sorts of dramatic representations and exhibitions, would easily dissipate, in the greater part of them, that melancholy and gloomy humor which is almost always the nurse of popular superstition and enthusiasm. Public diversions have always been the objects of dread and hatred to all the fanatical promoters of those popular frenzies. The gaiety and good humor which those diversions inspire were altogether inconsistent with that temper of mind which was fittest for their purpose, or which they could best work upon. Dramatic representations, besides, frequently exposing their artifices to public ridicule, and sometimes even to public execration, were, upon that account, more than all other diversions, the objects of their peculiar abhorrence. In a country where the law favored the teachers of no one religion more than those of another, it would not be necessary that any of them should have any particular or immediate dependency upon the sovereign or executive power, or that he should have anything to do either in appointing or in dismissing them from their offices. In such a situation, he would have no occasion to give himself any concern about them, further than to keep the peace among them, in the same manner as among the rest of his subjects, that is, to hinder them from persecuting, abusing, or oppressing one another. But it is quite otherwise in countries where there is an established or governing religion. The sovereign can in this case never be secure, unless he has the means of influencing, in a considerable degree, the greater part of the teachers of that religion." The clergy of every established church constitute a great incorporation. They can act in concert and pursue their interest upon one plan, and with one spirit as much as if they were under the direction of one man, and they are frequently, too, under such direction. Their interest as an incorporated body is never the same with that of the sovereign, and is sometimes directly opposite to it. Their great interest is to maintain their authority with the people, and this authority depends upon the supposed certainty and importance of the whole doctrine which they inculcate, and upon the supposed necessity of adopting every part of it with the most implicit faith, in order to avoid eternal misery. Should the sovereign have the imprudence to appear either to deride, or doubt himself of the most trifling part of their doctrine, or, from humanity, attempt to protect those who did either the one or the other, the punctilious honor of a clergy, 
who have no sort of dependency upon him, is immediately provoked to prescribe him as a profane person, and to employ all the terrors of religion, in order to oblige the people to transfer their allegiance to some more orthodox and obedient prince. Should he oppose any of their pretensions or usurpations, the danger is equally great. The princes who have dared in this manner to rebel against the church, over and above this crime of rebellion, have generally been charged, too, with the additional crime of heresy, notwithstanding their solemn protestations of their faith, and humble submission to every tenet which she thought proper to prescribe to them. But the authority of religion is superior to every other authority. The fears which it suggests conquer all other fears. When the authorized teachers of religion propagate through the great body of the people, doctrines subversive of the authority of the sovereign, it is by violence only, or by the force of a standing army, that he can maintain his authority. Even a standing army cannot in this case give him any lasting security, because if the soldiers are not foreigners, which can seldom be the case, but drawn from the great body of the people, which must almost always be the case, they are likely to be soon corrupted by those very doctrines. The revolutions which the turbulence of the Greek clergy was continually occasioning at Constantinople, as long as the Eastern Empire subsisted, the convulsions which, during the course of several centuries, the turbulence of the Roman clergy was continually occasioning in every part of Europe, sufficiently demonstrate how precarious and insecure must always be the situation of the sovereign, who has no proper means of influencing the clergy of the established and governing religion of his country. Articles of faith, as well as all other spiritual matters, it is evident enough, are not within the proper department of a temporal sovereign, who, though he may be very well qualified for protecting, is seldom supposed to be so for instructing the people. With regard to such matters, therefore, his authority can seldom be sufficient to counterbalance the united authority of the clergy of the established church. The public tranquillity, however, and his own security, may frequently depend upon the doctrines which they may think proper to propagate concerning such matters. As he can seldom directly oppose their decision, therefore, with proper weight and authority, it is necessary that he should be able to influence it, and he can influence it only by the fears and expectations which he may excite in the greater part of the individuals of the order. Those fears and expectations may consist in the fear of deprivation or other punishment, and in the expectation of further preferment. In all Christian churches, the benefices of the clergy are a sort of freeholds, which they enjoy, not during pleasure, but during life or good behavior. If they held them by a more precarious tenure, and were liable to be turned out upon every slight disobligation either of the sovereign or of his ministers, it would perhaps be impossible for them to maintain their authority with the people, who would then consider them as mercenary dependents upon the court, in the sincerity of whose instructions they could no longer have any confidence. But should the sovereign attempt irregularly, and by violence, to deprive any number of clergymen of their freeholds, on account, perhaps, of their having propagated, with more than ordinary zeal, some factious or seditious doctrine, he would only render, by such persecution, both them and their doctrine ten times more popular, and therefore ten times more troublesome and dangerous than they had been before. Fear is, in almost all cases, a wretched instrument of government, and ought, in particular, never to be employed against any order of men who have the smallest pretensions to independency. To attempt to terrify them serves only to irritate their bad humor, and to confirm in them an opposition, which more gentle usage, perhaps, might easily induce them either to soften or to lay aside altogether. The violence which the French government usually employed in order to oblige all their parliaments, or sovereign courts of justice, to enregister any unpopular edict, very seldom succeeded. The means commonly employed, however, the imprisonment of all the refractory members, one would think, were forcible enough. The princes of the House of Stuart sometimes employed the like means in order to influence some of the members of the Parliament of England, and they generally found them equally intractable. The Parliament of England is now managed in another manner, and the very small experiment which the Duke of Choiseul made about twelve years ago upon the Parliament of France demonstrated sufficiently that all the Parliaments of France might have been managed still more easily in the same manner. That experiment was not pursued. 
for though management and persuasion are always the easiest and safest instruments of government as force and violence are the worst and the most dangerous yet such it seems is the natural insolence of man that he almost always disdains to use the good instrument except when he cannot or dare not use the bad one the french government could and durst use force and therefore disdained to use management and persuasion but there is no order of men it appears i believe from the experience of all ages upon whom it is so dangerous or rather so perfectly ruinous to employ force and violence as upon the respected clergy of an established church the rights the privileges the personal liberty of every individual ecclesiastic who is upon good terms with his own order are even in the most despotic governments more respected than those of any other person of nearly equal rank and fortune it is so in every gradation of despotism from that of the gentle and mild government of paris to that of the violent and furious government of constantinople but though this order of men can scarce ever be forced they may be managed as easily as any other and the security of the sovereign as well as the public tranquillity seems to depend very much upon the means which he has of managing them and those means seem to consist altogether in the preferment which he has to bestow upon them in the ancient constitution of the christian church the bishop of each diocese was elected by the joint votes of the clergy and the people of the episcopal city the people did not long retain their right of election and while they did retain it they almost always acted under the influence of the clergy who in such spiritual matters appeared to be their natural guides the clergy however soon grew weary of the trouble of managing them and found it easier to elect their own bishops themselves the abbot in the same manner was elected by the monks of the monastery at least in the greater part of abbacies all the inferior ecclesiastical benefices comprehended within the diocese were collated by the bishop who bestowed them upon such ecclesiastics as he thought proper all church preferments were in this manner in the disposal of the church the sovereign though he might have some indirect influence in those elections and though it was sometimes usual to ask both his consent to elect and his approbation of the election yet had no direct or sufficient means of managing the clergy the ambition of every clergyman naturally led him to pay court not so much to his sovereign as to his own order from which only he could expect preferment through the greater part of europe the pope gradually drew to himself first the collation of almost all bishoprics and abbacies or of what were called consistorial benefices and afterwards by various machinations and pretenses of the greater part of inferior benefices comprehended within each diocese little more being left to the bishop than what was barely necessary to give him a decent authority with his own clergy by this arrangement the condition of the sovereign was still worse than it had been before the clergy of all the different countries of europe were thus formed into a sort of spiritual army dispersed in different quarters indeed but of which all the movements and operations could now be directed by one head and conducted upon one uniform plan the clergy of each particular country might be considered as a particular detachment of that army of which the operations could easily be supported and seconded by all the other detachments quartered in the different countries round about each detachment was not only independent of the sovereign of the country in which it was quartered and by which it was maintained but dependent upon a foreign sovereign who could at any time turn its arms against the sovereign of that particular country and support them by the arms of all the other detachments those arms were the most formidable that can well be imagined in the ancient state of europe before the establishment of arts and manufactures the wealth of the clergy gave them the sort of influence over the common people which that of the great barons gave them over their respective vassals, tenants and retainers in the great landed estates which the mistaken piety both of princes and private persons had bestowed upon the church jurisdictions were established of the same kind with those of the great barons and for the same reason in those great landed estates the clergy or their bailiffs could easily keep the peace without the support or assistance either of the king or of any other person and neither the king nor any other person could keep the peace there without the support and assistance of the clergy the jurisdictions of the clergy therefore in their particular baronies or manors were equally independent and equally exclusive of the authority of the king's courts as those of the great temporal lords 
the tenants of the clergy were like those of the great barons almost all tenants at will entirely dependent upon their immediate lords and therefore liable to be called out at pleasure in order to fight in any quarrel in which the clergy might think proper to engage them over and above the rents of those estates the clergy possessed in the tithes a very large portion of the rents of all the other estates in every kingdom of europe the revenues arising from both those species of rents were, the greater part of them, paid in kind, in corn, wine, cattle, poultry, etc. The quantity exceeded greatly what the clergy could themselves consume, and there were neither arts nor manufactures, for the produce of which they could exchange the surplus. The clergy could derive advantage from this immense surplus in no other way than by employing it, as the great barons employed the like surplus of their revenues, in the most profuse hospitality and in the most extensive charity. Both the hospitality and the charity of the ancient clergy, accordingly, are said to have been very great. They not only maintained almost the whole poor of every kingdom, but many knights and gentlemen had frequently no other means of subsistence than by travelling about from monastery to monastery, under pretense of devotion, but in reality to enjoy the hospitality of the clergy. The retainers of some particular prelates were often as numerous as those of the greatest lay lords, and the retainers of all the clergy taken together were perhaps more numerous than those of all the lay lords there was always much more union among the clergy than among the lay lords the former were under a regular discipline and subordination to the papal authority the latter were under no regular discipline or subordination but almost always equally jealous of one another and of the king though the tenants and retainers of the clergy therefore had both together been less numerous than those of the great lay lords and their tenants were probably much less numerous yet their union would have rendered them more formidable the hospitality and charity of the clergy too not only gave them the command of a great temporal force but increased very much the weight of their spiritual weapons those virtues procured them the highest respect and veneration among all the inferior ranks of people of whom many were constantly and almost all occasionally fed by them everything belonging or related to so popular an order its possessions its privileges its doctrines necessarily appeared sacred in the eyes of the common people and every violation of them whether real or pretended the highest act of sacrilegious wickedness and profaneness in this state of things if the sovereign frequently found it difficult to resist the confederacy of a few of the great nobility we cannot wonder that he should find it still more so to resist the united force of the clergy of his own dominions supported by that of the clergy of all the neighboring dominions in such circumstances the wonder is not that he was sometimes obliged to yield but that he was ever able to resist end of book five chapter one part g